and welcome to another TRADOC Leader Professional Development Discussion. I'm Sarah Houck, Command Information Chief for the TRADOC Communication Directorate, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. We've got a great topic focused on the Army people strategy and building cohesive teams for you today. I'm joined by leaders on that exact topic. First is Lieutenant General Maria Gervais, TRADOC's Deputy Commanding General and the Chief of Staff. Lieutenant General Gervais has been the DCG of TRADOC since May of last year, and if you've joined us for previous LPDs, you'll know that General Gervais is one of our most frequent and favorite guests. Welcome, ma'am. It's always a pleasure to have you. Welcome back again. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah. It's definitely an honor um, to be back serving as a host for uh, yet another great um, LPD um, session, and really I'm, I'm honored to be per participating in this session because, you know, we are joined by my great friend, Gary Brito, who is joining us today. He's a transformational leader. He's known for building, uh, being a great teammate and building cohesive teams wherever he has served uh, throughout this. So I really look forward to being able to discuss some of the initiatives that we have here going on at TRADOC to build cohesive teams. Before I mention, since it's, public, it's publication in October of 2019, today we're gonna to talk about what that strategy really means. For instance, what talent, man, talent management looks like, what improved professional military education is, how the culture of the Army is, about, is evolving, and how TRADOC fits into all of those pieces. And just as a reminder, before we get started, we want you to be part of the discussion. So leave your questions in the comments section of wherever you're tuned in, and we'll try to get them answered during the event. And with that, we're going to get things started. Uh, General Brito, I actually want to get started with you. So could you start with the basics? Could you provide us a broad overview of what exactly the Army People Strategy is and kind of an analysis of how it's been going since its implementation back in 2019? Sure. Thanks for the question. And I'll take the risk of being, being a little geeky just for a minute, <laughs> a moment as we start. And that the strategy is exactly that, ends, ways, and means to take care of our most precious pacing item. And that's the 1.1 million uniformed soldiers we have, approximately 250,000 civilians we have, all part of the Army team, and of course, the families and dependents that support. Great big professional organization. So everywhere from uh, using major lines of reference, from assessing and bringing in the right soldiers to lead our army. I'm sorry, to, to serve our army. The talent management initiatives to lead our army. A civilian and military implementation plan for those in uniform, and as I mentioned, for our distinguished uh, civilian employees, all part of the great army team. Those lines of effort connected to the campaign plan, and that'll be my last comment on the DG's part. Uh, what's probably most important for, for, for those in the audience today is taking action and moving the ball forward on all those lines of effort. And also addressing the tough problems. Like if we have any challenges with recruiting, get ahead of it now. 21st century focus on talent management, continuing to, to, to work the initiative uh, that the Army's come up with at, at the headquarters of the DA level. And more importantly, the trade off is a great, great example of it. Implementing all of that down at the field level, the operational level, recruiting, professional military education, the soldier for life, transition programs, all the complete nucleus that manages the lifeline, tip to tail, of bringing in a soldier and ensuring that he or she has a, a, is treated with dignity and respect. They terminate from the military or even retire. So to get to the opening question, I assess, and it's not just a personal opinion, you measure it up here as well, that the Army People's Strategy is going quite well, all of those in uniform. And uh, through our Assistant Secretary of Manpower Reserve, aka MNRA, uh, we assess uh, the progress of the People's Strategy and literally as we speak, are updating it to ensure that it's future focused addresses the challenges that may be facing us as an army now and creates the conditions for the military and the civilian to be the best they can be, part and part particular, and, and achieve their potential. And we give them the resources and the, and the policies that need to make that happen. Uh, so I have been accused of rules colored glasses and I'm gonna keep those rules colored glasses on. As work with the trade off and others, we will. Uh, continue to deliver the best environment and resources that our army needs, those who serve, 
and so our Army's combat ready at all times, as evidenced by what's going on in the world today. I could talk for an hour on this topic, but I'll pause and thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that, General Brito, for kind of your analysis and your basic overview of the Army people strategy, because it's a big thing to get our arms wrapped around. It encompasses some of the biggest pieces of the Army um, force and the profession as a whole. So I actually wanted to ask you, uh, General Dervey, what are some of the initiatives or big pieces that we've implemented since 2019 that, as General Brito said, are moving this ball down the road to Army success and really kind of fully adopting the people strategy? Yeah. Hey, hey, thanks a lot, Sarah. That's a great, great question. Um, because, you know, I think as um, General Brito was kind of laying out the people uh, strategy, which we were part of developing, I think what's important for everybody to understand is that we, we take that strategy from um, the Department of the Army. And what we do in TRADOC is we kind of operationalize that or we kind of put that into action so that it can be driven across the Army to make the change. And I think, you know, um, we have done that through the development of a TRADOC campaign plan, which is focused very much on similar lines of efforts um, that you heard General Brito put out. And so as we took a look at that, what we had to do is we wanted to figure out where did we need to actually put it in, whether that was going to be in, in our doctrine, in our training, our leader development, our professional military education, and then even how we actually put that into our basic combat training where we're bringing you know, the, the newest soldiers through training to give them a skill so that they can serve in the Army. And so we took a very holistic view of the Army people's strategy so that we could identify the things that we needed to do where and at what echelon and in which domain of .mil PF, which is doctor and organization training leader uh, development, um, and also our education um, piece of that. And so um, lots of initiatives. I mean, just starting with basic combat training where we teach you know, our values and what we do as an Army and what right looks like. And really where the essence of what team building really starts to take shape in, in, in our Army. And, you know, we're the drill sergeants through the training um, and bringing these civilians and transforming them into soldiers. That's where you start to see our Army values trust. And I think it's important with cohesive teams to truly understand that it's the core foundational elements. It, it, it really is. It's um, trust, you know, building um, trust. And also, you know, it's trust and building, you know, faith in your leaders in our soldiers, in our equipment, you know, from an individual perspective, from a collective perspective, and then so we can execute our, our mission. And so we have, uh, as I just said, there are lots, lots of initiatives, and I could go on um, on a lot of them, um, you know, from how we change the way we train basic combat training to how we're doing talent management, uh, how we're selecting our leaders with our command assessment programs, um, also how we're actually improving, you know, everything from being able to train our soldiers with our tra TRADOC organic medical structure so that we can get soldiers through training to even what we're doing with the operational force, you know, with the holistic health and fitness piece of that. And then, you know, how we're developing our leaders with through Project Athena. How do you come in and assess our leaders as they're coming in, not just our leaders, but, you know, even our en enlisted, our NCOs, our war officers to provide them you know, an assessment so that they can understand their strengths and weaknesses, they can understand, you know, their leadership traits, and they can get coaching and mentoring to go through on that. Um, and then we're looking at all kind of barriers that could exist that could erode that trust that we have down at the lowest levels. Um, and then there's, this is my squad, my squad on ownership. So I've just kind of broad brushed them because I could talk at length on all of them. So I'm just going to be quiet right now to see if there's another comment or, <laughs> or we want to go in a different direction, but I can come back and because uh, it could be like 1150 by the time I, I get know, done. Those are, this is, that was a very broad question that I asked for sure. Um, I actually wanted to touch on something that I think we might kind of lose touch in is that the people strategy doesn't mean just the individuals in the army who wear the uniform. So what is how do the civilians, the Army civilians, fit into the Army profession and into this people's strategy? I think we'll start with you, and then I know General Brito probably has some, some feedback as well on the, the civilian side of the people strategy. Yeah, so, um, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, we want to build cohesive teams for 
everybody that is on this team. I mean, if you think about it, we, you know, we have those that are in uniform. We also have those civilians that support everything we do. We even have contractors that are part of our teams. We have volunteers that are part of our team. And you want everybody to feel like they're a valued member of this team. And so in the people strategy, we are looking at all kinds of, you know, the military, military implementation plan, but the civilian implementation plan with the same level of effort that we are for the military. What are those things that we have to improve in terms of how do we develop our civilian workforce? How do we also make sure that you know, our civilian workforce has the tools that are necessary um, from a development standpoint? And then on top of it, I'll just share this with you. Just this past Monday, I actually spoke at the, uh, you know, our civilian education um, forum where we had 40 uh, of our up and coming GS-13s and above that were from across our Army kind of developing them and sharing topics on what we're doing. So you've got to put the same amount of energy because we want our total force across and all compos to be able to build cohesive teams. Excellent. And so I hear we hear total force all the time, and it's nice to know that civilians are part of that total force. We think total force, we think National Guard um, and our reserve units, but to know that it's our active duty guard reserve and our civilians that's a really great kind of definition of what that actually means so general brito um, from your point of view uh, how important was it to ensure that your team included the civilians in this army people strategy when it was being built back in the uh, 2019. the bluff up front extremely important but i want to give a little context and, and i'm going to make an assumption we have some uh, younger leaders on the audience today so I'll put this in your captain's career course or your or your or your bullock or what have you, BLT language here. So we had a military military decision making process. Saw a problem that needed to be fixed. So you know, we we looked at the the enemy things that may keep us from being our very best. Uh, developed some concepts, developed some options, looked at our troop to task. And, and building on the troop to task issue of those in uniform and those of civilians are as equally important. I mentioned up front, we're just under 280,000 uh, civilians in our, in our military. So to give somewhat of a wave top analogy, to make the best non-commissioned officer or officer, you're gonna recruit them or assess them. You're gonna train them, you're gonna educate them and take care of their families as well. Broadly speaking, those three concepts, and General Gervais gave some great examples, must and should apply to our civilians as well. So there's training opportunities, there's educational opportunities. Uh, you can go to senior service colleges, there's GS-15 or SESs in some cases just as well. And we owe that to our distinguished civilians. And quite frankly, if you took that, both the people and the functions out, the Army would come to a, a pretty much a put on the brakes for a while, for a long while. Uh, so it just needs to be that way. Another aspect of this, many of the civilians that do support our army in some cases may be family members of those that, that are in uniform. So that nucleus of the 101.1 plus million and the plus is the civilians that are all part of this army profession must be taken care of. And, and having been in uniform for, for a couple of decades now, I can tell you the, the leadership, energy, and the, the innovative ideas behind this civilian implementation plan, which is an annex of the Army People Strategy, is exactly focused on the right things of taking care of our civilians. And, and from this perch, I've seen the benefits of the education, the opportunities for broadening, and, and caring for their families as well. So I guess that's a, a five minute answer for extremely important. I know. It is nested with our secretary, Secretary Warmoth, and our chief of staff as well. Thank you. No, absolutely. We appreciate that. I know that, again, I keep asking these big, broad stroke answers, but I, we really appreciate kind of, because these are important to be able to break down these big strategies that just have huge pieces to them. So we appreciate you taking the time for those. And I know at the beginning when you were kind of describing the people strategy, you mentioned um, just kind of quality of life pieces that were introduced into this strategy and how your team was really going to start um, looking at those things that may harm that um, that aspect of our soldiers and our civilians. So how do 
um, quality of life measures fit into the people strategy? And what are some of the maybe the new initiatives that um, our soldier or our force may have seen since 2019? Maybe are there any um, up and coming that we will start to see in the force in the in the near future? Yes, sir. I had to, uh, the comms at this end a little choppy, but I think you were talking about quality of life initiatives. Uh, well, well, perfect. Uh, well, what we're doing at the people face the strategic level, headquarters VA level, joined at the hip with my battle buddy and the G9 that has a lot, has a fast section for the countries who should not care about that right now. Uh, that we're quality of life issues, whether it's uh, child care, uh, housing, playgrounds, all of those things that give the proper and well-deserved quality of life for the families. And, and here's a big connection with all that trade up is doing, resiliency programs, family programs such as sponsorships, our sponsorship program, uh, the suicide prevention, sexual assault, sexual harassment, all of that that, that feeds into uh, putting the, the concrete we need and the resiliency for our soldiers and families. So this is a direct nexus. And to bring it up to my level or the, the headquarters VA level, I mentioned the Secretary for Manpower, Jeffrey Fares, who has oversight of a lot of what we're doing in the people space and what they're doing in the quality of life uh, in the space as well. So clearly a nexus, not only in funding, which no one on the audience should, should be concerned about, but as General 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 Gervais uh, mentioned taking it from all level and operationalizing it down in the field. And lastly, not to take too much stage time, especially for training and doctrine command, which is largely executing uh, the programs that are nested to professional military education, uh, soldier for life, transition programs, you name it. And uh, so our, I, we need to provide the glue to ensure that this is operationalized down at, 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 at the usual level. And then lastly, having the, the vision to, to see what is ahead of us and get at it now uh, so that funding and other issues simply don't become an issue and it's seamless down to most of the young leaders on this audience. So I'm actually going to pose the same question to you. So quality of life, uh, General Berto mentioned a couple that TRADOC is kind of implementing, is putting into effect, is working on getting ready to launch. So what do you? What are some of those, like one or two of those that we are working with right now? Um, and what's in the future to better those programs or introduce new programs to make that a little more robust? Yeah. Hey, so, you know, um, Sarah, I think as you take a look at it and, you, and we talk about TRADOC, and what we do to really kind of push what we're doing down in through all the way th to the lowest levels within the Army. I, I, I think it's really important to understand the why behind all of this, right? And we're talking quality of life right now, but you know what it comes down to? And it comes down to trust. It comes down to the trust that we have, you know, one, to the individual, two, um, you know, the individual to their team leader, to their leaders, the trust they have in their equipment, the trust they have in their training, and then, you know, the trust that we're taking care of on, on, on all of this. So when, you know, when some of these things from a quality of life things happen, you know, it, it breaks trust with, um, you know, those that we lead. And so the quality of life is, is so important. And the fact that we need to make sure that we are listening to our, you know, to all of our teammates that are out there so that we understand where those things that are breaking down in terms of, of trust. And so, I mean, one of them, I mean, the big one is the harmful behaviors right now. I mean, we, we know that we're, we're struggling with sexual assault, sexual harassment. We know that we are struggling with suicide um, within, our, within the ranks. And what we have to do is make sure that we are addressing those issues because, I mean, number one, you know, things like extremism, racism, um, you know, sexual assault, sexual harassment, that is not consistent with who we are as an army um, or our values. So what we need to do is make sure that as we are addressing those, we have good programs in place to prevent this from occurring. So one of the things that TRADOC is doing right now, and we are partnering with, um, with the entire team up at the Department of the Army, um, with the G1, ASA, with the G9, and all of the teammates up there, 
to we are actually doing a prevention gap analysis, which is going to help inform what is it that we need in, to be able to address at Echelon to prevent, you know, these um, harmful behaviors. You know, same thing with this is my squad. How do we educate and get these things inside of our education so that, you know, we start to take ownership of these challenges down at the lowest levels so that we can, as a profession, make sure that we bring everybody on the team and they know that they're going to be a valued member of that team and they're not going to um, not be included uh, in the team and we're not going to erode trust. You know, not just with you know, those that we're leading, but with our leaders, with the American people. Because that's what we're, we're really trying to get after. So there are a lot of initiatives that we are working with quality of life on the prevention program. Also, how do you have a better, what are the things that we need to do to better um, respond and take care if something does happen? So everything from starting in basic combat training, you know, we are starting with the way, first of all, we bring you know, the young civilians in, and we, we're, we're going in and no more shark attack. No more where we're coming in and, you know, we're kind of fo more focused on breaking them down, but we're, we're more focused on, hey, this, we are a professional army. We want you to be part of this team. And so with that, and then also the fact that what we've done is implemented, and primarily due to COVID, it gave us an actual opportunity because in this process, we put yellow phase in place, which now comes in and it says, okay, the first two weeks, because we needed to quarantine, we focused on ensuring that you understood what right looked like, you understood what the Army values were, you understood what resources, and then as they went into the regular training, they kind of had a good set. What we've seen because of that approach, it's reduced the harmful behaviors, it's also um, improved the actual understanding of the resources that, were, that are out there. So those in um, yellow phase, um, has actually started really improving those harmful behaviors. It has increased the trust that is out there. But you know what we also found? And, and quite frankly, it was because, you know, of the great work of our family members and volunteers. What they said was, hey, you got a soldier in training. But look, the Army is about a family, right? We, we come in and soldiers have families. So how do we start educating the family? You know, with everything that we do, what's the life in a soldier? What are the resources? What does right look like? The whole nine yards. So, you know, inside the wire initiative, which started at one of our installations to inform the family. Also, how do we inform them, in, you know, from a Facebook? I will tell you that has been tremendous because that's the very foundation of who we are right there. And then as we pass them off into, um, you know, the operational force, what you're seeing is now we're improving everything in the operational force. And then we're, what we're trying to do is drive it in our doctrine. You know, everything from what is it from a sharp, um, you know, sexual harassment, sexual assault piece. What is it we need to drive into doctrine in terms of being engaged leaders and understanding what engaged leaders means, taking care of your soldiers and how to do it. How do we drive organizations like you know, our TRADOC organic medical structure, our H2F. We're trying to drive that all the way across doctrine, organization, our training, and leader development. Because, you know, when you do that, that's where you drive change. And so really excited about all the different things um, that we're doing. Uh, there's more, but I'll, <laughs> I'm getting off the stage, Gary, because I know you got lots of great things. Well, if I could take just a second to, to build on that, the great thing about that, what he said. And I know I'll go to the policy level at the headquarters of DA, but we support all of that. But look at it, I'd like to give it a small, small example. So training soldiers, you know, future soldiers with long hair and mustache, and they come in IET and really start to really adopt the, the importance of the Army culture and get great training as well. The same expands to our leaders, you know, coming in their bullets and captain career courses and develop it for, for our distinguished civilians as well. So if you take that one plus two plus three equal rank cohesive teams, which is a very, very important. One, it's a priority nested with people, uh, with our chief of staff and our secretary, but those cohesive teams that trust each other and trust their leaders, and I, I put stop on that, plus engaged leaders will give us a combat readiness we need, period. Uh, that it will, well-trained cohesive teams that trust each other that are disciplined live and breathe the army values and i don't say that as a buffer sticker 
equals combat readiness in the environment. We're seeing it today in a very positive way. So that's that nexus between the policies, funding, and everything else that have come out of this building and operationalized, as General DeRay said up front, through training and doctrine command, and really operationalized by those young leaders and soldiers that are out there in the virtual world now that are going to do this. And if you pay attention to all that stuff that gives the cohesive teams, we will always have a, a combat ready army. I'm getting motivated, but I'll shut up for now. Let somebody else take it. <laughs> no, sir, that's a great point. Um, I think some of the biggest questions we always have when we um, host these LPDs is how do they tie back to what people would think that is the traditional readiness? So those individuals who could grab their kits and go and defend our nation. So they think that the people strategy pulling back those layers of um, the trust in uh, the trust and respect that we have within our teams is actually vital. So sometimes they question why we're focused so much on sexual assault, sexual um, harassment prevention, that suicide prevention, the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion pieces of our people and our forces. But in order to be combat ready, we really have to get behind those and support those programs to be sure that we do have highly trained, um, disciplined, physically fit, cohesive teams that are indestructible in an operational environment. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up and made that readiness connection because that is kind of one of the big things that we get when we have these more mm -hmm. um, non-traditional readiness pieces, if you will, um, that are discussed and focused on within the Army. It's just they've been such a different, they've been such a focus lately that I think sometimes the operational, everyday traditional Army picture has been um, changed in the in a good way those are great things to focus on but you know sir i mean <clears throat> yep yeah, um exactly sometimes it's more difficult to make the link but but here's the thing i mean people equal readiness right it they're not two different things right and and so when you look at it yes we got to make sure that the equipment's ready we got to make sure that the training um has been done but look the army is about people and so we've got to make from a, a, you know, individual standpoint and then a team standpoint, we have got to make sure that, you know, number one, the, the person is taken care of. The person is part of a collective team. The person feels valued. They have trust. If they have problems or their, fam their family has problems, I mean, look, we have problems. And what we got, so that's how it translates over to the readiness, because if you don't feel like you're a valued member of that team, we are not going to maximize your potential. We are not going to leverage everything that you bring to the table because quite frankly, why would you want to come to the table? And you know, when, that's why that eroding that trust and those harmful behaviors are, are, are so important um, in this aspect. So, you know, um, we've been discussing people first and versus readiness, right? That's kind of the way it's been being discussed at sometimes. Well, it's not. It, it, it is not one or the other. See, we know that, you know, if you think about it, we know that if our people are ready, the mission will be taken care of. So it's, you know, take care of your people because when they know that you care, they will care. And when they feel like they're part of a valued team, they will contribute to that team. But at the same time, we got to make ensure readiness too. So, you know, when there's a decision that has to be made that, you know, for either the mission there, there are ways to also make sure you're taking care of your people. I will tell you the thing that I thought, I've always thought throughout my entire career, the greatest responsibility that I have as a leader and as an, as an individual that is leading, you know, America's sons and daughters, is that my job is to make sure that they are ready, they can execute their mission with their equipment, and when we, when we have to go, Number one responsibility is we bring America's sons and daughters back. And you do that through tough, realistic training, making sure the equipment and making sure you have that trust there. Um, so I'd just offer that piece. No, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of great things that TRADOC has been implementing that um, have kind of come out of or have been developed with the people strategy in mind. Like you mentioned, ACFT earlier, or the H2F earlier. The ACFT falls right into that, obviously, and those are more of the traditional readiness pieces that do focus on the physical person. Um, so we do actually have a question for the, from the audience, so I wanted to get this out there. Um, so with so many NCOs needing to attend um, ACL or SCL, SLC, sorry, are there plans of increasing the amount of instructors um, across the Army? So 
I think as training, we'll let General Gervais kind of tackle that one. Yeah, so, you know, I, I will tell you that making sure that we have the, um, you know, the, the correct instructors and we have the ability to get our soldiers into training is, you know, of utmost importance to one Sergeant Major of the Army and also to Command Sergeant Major Hendricks um, as we're going through here. Because quite frankly, the way we develop our leaders is, and we train our leaders and educate our leaders to perform and lead our soldiers is getting them into to these courses. So, you know, I think, you know, have we have come out of a, um, you know, where our focus has been for two decades. You know, we kind of had to come back and we have to make sure that we can right size some of these instructor courses. So I know that this is on Sergeant Major Hendricks and SMA's um, radar scope. And we are looking at how do we train the load to make sure that we can develop the leaders because that's what's so important um, right now to make sure, you know, you can, you can and we can defer these things but it comes at a cost. And you know, some people will say, hey, I just want to stay in my operational unit. I'm getting all the experience I need. You'll be amazed. The additional leadership skills, the education you get by attending these courses. So you know, I know I gave you a big broad answer on that. We can d dive deep on that and share um, later on exactly what the plans are. Sir, I have a question. Well, there's General Funk. Thanks for joining us, sir. So I'm here with the great uh, team from Fordham and all the other various universities around uh, New York City here. And uh, I, I, I'm going to take this all the way down to the micro level, OK? So uh, uh, we're, we're talking about nobody uh, cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So what I want to do is have General Gervais and General Brito tell their Army story, and then I promise not to interrupt again, OK? So. I'm going to start with General Gervais. Tell your Army story. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in a military uh, family. My dad had 26 years in the military, um, and I was the seventh of nine kids. I was a basketball player, um, as, and I really thought life was about basketball. So, um, you know, when I hurt my knee, my final high school regular season softball game, and although I was heavily recruited to play basketball, they were still knocking. However, they said you could walk on and earn your scholarship. And I said I was the seventh of nine kids. So my mom and dad, they didn't have any money. Um, quite frankly, I didn't have any money, but I knew I wanted to play basketball. So I made a decision to stay at home. I rode my bike every day, and I took out student loans to get my, um, my education. I played two years of basketball. Um, however, you know, um, continuing to get hurt, I decided I needed to do something different. Now, um, when I went to go think about getting a job, here's what I got told. I, I was told that number one, I didn't have any experience even though I was going to have a biology degree. Number two, um, I didn't have any money and I thought I needed a little more discipline in my life. So I decided um, at a point in time that I was going to actually enlist into the Army. But my father told me to look at going into the reserve officer training program at the college that I was attending in South Carolina. So, um, you know, I actually did, but I didn't join until the end of my junior year. And I went to basic training. I participated in ROTC my senior year, and then I was commissioned at the end of camp. I thought um, I wanted to be a physical therapist because, you know, I hurt my knee. I was really interested in the body, but the Army needed me to be a chemical officer. And quite frankly, you know, when they um, told me that, I remember I got the letter, and I went home that night, and I told my father that um, <clears throat> the Army made a mistake because I needed to be a physical therapist. They said I was going to be a physical therapist, but they needed me to be a chemical officer. So my dad read that letter, and after a couple minutes, which felt like hours, he just told me, he said, the Army didn't make, make a mistake. You failed to read the fine print. Now, I had my contract, so I said, Dad, what fine print? I don't understand. I read the contract. And he goes, no, you don't understand. You serve at the, peop uh, the pleasure of the people in the United States of America, and your army needs you to be a chemical officer. He goes, so you need to go out there and be the best chemical officer you can. And then he said, don't get fired, which scared me more than anything else. But I, I got to tell you, when I came in, my thought process was I was only going to stay for three years. I was going to be the worst chemical officer ever, and they were going to let me go be a physical therapist. I'd pursue that. But I got to tell you, when I came in, and I, my first unit of assignment was um, 17th Field Artillery in Germany, and I had the best NCOs, the best leaders. They taught me what it meant to me, you know, what it really meant to move, shoot, and communicate. 
and the importance of what we do in the Army. And although I said I was going to be in for three years, I loved every minute of it. I loved the people, and I actually enjoyed being a chemical officer. So here I am 34 years later, and I'm going to turn it over to Gary. All right. Hey, General Funk, thanks for, for the question. One, your leadership and mentorship over the years, and a welcome to the Army for all the future soldiers that are out there on the table with you. Uh, my stepdad was in the Navy, and I was only with him for about six years, but in those six years, went to three high schools. And the one I graduated in from is the one I probably should have stayed in because my, my, my father graduated from there as well, back in a little town in Massachusetts. There. So a little bit of stage setting there. A, a, a future leaders, I actually joined ROTC, I went to Penn State University. I was a non-scholarship cadet. I couldn't get my grades together. It took a little while. But I actually joined ROTC as an extracurricular activity. And that is a very true story. And wanted to give it a little bit of time, join the range of challenge and others, just, just like some of the things you do. And was motivated by the leadership opportunities, uh, the outdoors events, uh, the work ethic, and just a cohort of friends that I like being with and working with. And so just like many, went off to camp and excelled just as anybody does and wanted to be an infantry officer and did. I uh, was commissioned into the infantry and stayed at uh, in my entire time in the military. Of course, you do a variety of things. Uh, but as mentioned, the work ethic kept me in. We were going to do just like General Gervais said, do three, four years of punch but decided not to, like the work ethic, like the people. And I'll share this with you as well. Really was inspired by seeing change and, and what the military can do for a young soldier who may not have any other opportunity and to see them get promoted in advance. The same for the officers as well. So the leadership aspects of it, the work ethic, and what it does for this big mosaic called the United States of America, where you have soldiers from all 50 states and territories join is what has kept me in now for 35 years. So I would offer the same to you. It's just a, a, a great, great professional organization where you know you make a difference every day and our country needs it. So a lot like Maria, I would say that the same. Uh, when this, when I walked by an information booth in Altoona, Pennsylvania, one of the branch campuses, I was a like, Captain Payne who said, hey, what do you think about ROTC? Uh, he, he got promoted to major pain. I'll let you put that joke together in a minute. Uh, but that was the beginning of this 35-year-old journey now. And don't regret any step. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to you two. And uh, Sarah, I, I, wouldn't, I won't put you on the spot, but uh, I also tell your story too. So I, I'm incredibly thankful for both of you for leading our great organization. And uh, people are in great hands because you two are steering the ship of our Army's people strategy. Uh, thanks again. And uh, we're going to drop off now so I can put, the, put them to sleep before lunch. So uh, I'm proud of all of you. Have a great day. Thanks again. Victory starts here. Thank you, sir, for joining us. We appreciate you and to all the cadets as well. Thank you all for joining us. That was a special treat. So it's always great when we are able to get um, several of Tradoc's leaders here. And General Brito's, like I mentioned in his uh, intro, he's a former Tradoc leader. So just all the Tradoc leadership here to continue this discussion. So um, I kind of wanted to pull some strings on everyone's people um, army story a little bit and kind of tie it back to the people strategy. So. You kind of talked about how you had this set of skills when you walked into the recruiter's office and they kind of looked at it and said, you know what, you might fit here. We've talked a lot about talent management today um, and how the Army is trying to improve and maybe create some different talent management um, opportunities. So where does talent management actually start in TRADOC? Is it all the way down at with our recruiters who are getting those, those civilians in and kind of looking at them? Um, are we really placing people where they need to be, or are we just how, how does talent management start from the moment somebody walks through TRADOC's door? Well, so, sir, I would submit that it actually starts even well before that. Because if you take a look at what we as an Army have to do for our nation, and what we're going to have to do in the future. It really comes from what are the right skills that we need in order to execute our, our mission for um, the, the nation. 
And so, you know, when we look into the future, there are things that we know we're going to have to change in terms of like right now, if you look at where the future is going, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, th those kind of skill sets, data scientists, you know, um, so because we're more digital, right? So skill sets are changing and so is the equipment that we're operating. So we identify that and then of course it goes back to now that tells us who do we have to recruit and what leaders do we need, um, what is the enlisted, what, and what are the responsible cohorts in order to uh, form those cohesive collective teams across the board for our Army. So, you know, from a identification of skill set, that's where it's at. So the young civilian who wants to come into the Army, they're, they're kind of taking a test. This is what I like to do. This is what I'm good at. And based on that, then they'll be offered different opportunities for jobs in, in the, the Army. And then we take them through basic. Now, basic is the basic foundations that they need in terms of to be a soldier. Hands down, we all get it, it and we all need it because we all have to be, so, remember, we're soldiers first, and then we provide a skill to our Army. And so um, once they come out of school, their school, their advanced individual training or their captain or basic officer leader course or the warrant officer course, they now have a skill that um, they need. And it's at that point in time where, you know, the great folks at Human Resources Command and also the G1 um, working with all of the different centers tell us how many we actually need and where they need to go. But see, th that's just the start of it. But then after that, the opportunities for the, the, you know, the individual to now be, have the opportunity to say, this is where I want to go. They can even sign up right now to say, I want to be my station of choice. So I have a skill, I want to go to this station of choice, um, and, or I want this specific MOS. But once they come in and they're out, then we have, you know, the new talent management process, the AIM process that says, here are all the jobs available. If I need to go to this job and that's one, I get to, you know, apply, be interviewed, I get the opportunity to be selected as we're going through. And I will tell you the important thing about talent management is leaders. Leaders um, involved in understanding talent, understanding where they need to be developed, how they need to be developed, and where they need to go um, for next job. And, you know, that's engaged leadership all the way up. That was why that school question was so important, right? Because, you know, if we, we're not managing those kind of things, we're not developing our leaders or our talent, right? Because that's what it is. It's not just that, it's talent um, that we're trying to execute. But my good friend Gary can talk more about that <laughs> since... Um, you know, we have a lot of initiatives right now. My good friend Maria put a good stage setting there. <laughs> uh, I would tell you, Steve, and, and this is not just a project, but this is truly happening now, is 21st century talent management. I'll give a few examples. It is no longer the industrial age, age management system where you have a body pulse and a social security number, you go here. So the knowledge, skills, and behaviors we, we were using that as a basis for, for some precision talent management and that not only do you get the formal education and training, regardless of your ranks, in some aspects, this applies to our non-commissioned officers as well, but those knowledge, skills, and behaviors, KSPs, and preferences weigh in to managing the talent. And she gave a great, a great example. I, I may have an infantry officer or a chemical officer or a sergeant who has a skill set that we would not have seen in the past that may make him or her best for this assignment or to go to school to be a cyber officer or the best observer control at the National Training Center. And that nexus between those three needs to needs to happen. That's the 21st century focus tied to everything General Gervais mentioned as well. And the education training, the career path that goes with it. Uh, I don't want to stay, take all the stage time, but at the DA level, what we just mentioned is, is if you follow my hand and arm signals here from the Army People Strategy, 21st century talent management focus. And the operationalizing down that on, onto the ground is exactly where we are going. And this is more than dry erase board now. It's happening as we speak. Enabled by uh, some web-based systems that we'll, we'll, we'll have in the future, IPSA, and, and a few other focuses. But it, it is not your grandfather's army and, and the management of people now. It's, it's very future-focused. Our soldiers and leaders want it. They, it's, it, it is what the, what the feedback we've gotten from the field and allows us to give that precision talent management and build skill sets, uh, some of which we don't even know yet, as we continue to modernize, which is also quite a trade-off. Thank you. 
We appreciate that, sir, because that it that's always the big thing is how do we make the the um, evaluation process a little more personal, a little more qualitative as opposed to just chalk checks in the box. And it sounds like the Army People Strategy is really starting to evaluate how we um, develop and build our force through these individuals. And what comes to mind is those battalion commander assessment programs okay. and those um, commander assessment programs. We're really digging into who these individuals are as leaders. Are they fit to be a leader that's going to be trusted and respected to lead those teams and build those teams that are built on trust and um, really build something that's cohesive? So we appreciate that. And General Brodo, I'm gonna throw another question to you. Um, so how does the Army People Strategy suggest we address the intrinsic bias that seems to be present towards the service members or the DA civilians as opposed to the active duty service members? That was a question that we received from um, our audience. Sir, I, I have to apologize. Could you repeat the, the meat of that question? It's, it's the audio at my end. I didn't get most of that. I apologize. So um, how is the people strategy addressing the, the bias that kind of seems prevalent in um, the workforce towards civilians and um, active duty forces? It, there seems to be kind of an unbalance of uh, focus within the people strategy how, or within the force. How is the people strategy getting after that bias? Sure. I, I would say, you know, the, the big umbrella or the initial focus of the talent manager was, was looked at with our, our uniform, the, the biggest cohort. We actually, when I say biggest cohort, started with officers first because it was more manageable uh, to, to initiate many of the initiatives. Broadly, many of those have expanded down to our non-commissioned officers as well. I'll give an example. You mentioned the command assessment program. The first one, which I happen to be on, was focused on battalion commanders. It has since expanded to sergeant major, nom nominated sergeant majors, chaplains, medical, the whole bit. That's an example. Now, what we didn't have in the first draft of the people strategy, we do now, is a civilian implementation plan, which includes career management paths for our, our civilians that are all part of the cohort, educational opportunities, credentialing and licensing opportunities that did not exist. To, to close, and I don't want to put it in a negative way, but to kind of close the gap and, 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 and give a level of uh, equal talent management, if I understood the subject question properly, uh, for the entire Army, whether we're in a suit and tie or we're in OCPs today. Um, so the trajectories are starting, the, the two rail lanes are, are running parallel now. And we, we there's some union issues and things we work through as well, but the end state, of having the most professional combat ready force for the civilian or military is where everything is heading now. But that's a great question. And when we listen to the field, listen to the field as General Gervais said up front. No. Thank you, sir. Uh, General, do you wanna expand on that a little bit on how TRADOC may be focusing on that, kind of bringing them together to one total force as opposed to those separate buckets of um, yeah, um, sir, if, if, if I can, you know, because I think that's a, a really great question because we all have intrinsic biases, right? I mean, we do, and it's just a product of our experience. And I think the first thing you have to do is you have to be self-aware, you know, so you got to understand your biases and you got to be able to, you know, understand and catch yourself when you start to use these biases. So I'm really encouraged by the actual use of bias training in a lot of different things to come back and just kind of kind of recalibrate you to say hey be careful how you do that and i know the question was with da civilians but i think we intrinsic bias also you know active duty versus reserve and national guard um you know with civilians so when i kind of look at it I mean, I look at it from the standpoint of, you know, it's the training. So the incorporation of this training and, you know, we got things, for example, right now, we're piloting something called Game Changer right here that really takes you through all of these steps in terms of your biases, how to understand to, to form cohesive teams and be inclusive, right, as you're doing it. But I think, too, um, I think we really got to think our way through this and because, you know, unfortunately, we just start binning things combat arms, non-combat arms, male, female. I mean, you can go on and on and on. But I think the thing that we gotta remember in this process, it really is, it's about the team. 
It's about the team, you know, how we treat people with dignity and respect, how we understand strengths and weaknesses, and how we create that positive environment that is inclusive with diversity. And, and you're less concerned about they're a DA civilian, right? You're more concerned about they have a skill, they have a function, they're going to make our team actually more powerful. You know, and I think I always try and bring it back to that essence right there because you could quickly start bending everybody, right? Um, and that's why, you know, I start off with the first when I think I said it earlier. So we're all soldiers first, right? Then we're, you know, and I think that's always important to understand. And, and I think it goes back to what Gary was saying, right? Leadership. Leadership is so instrumental in all of this and understanding and setting the right conditions to build the cohesive teams. Because, you know, you could say, take this outside and say, okay, we're Army, now we have to work with other services. Or we have to work, it just would go on and on. It's more important about how do you build that, the fundamental of that cohesive team and why, the why behind it. Okay, I talked too long, sorry <laughs> Gary. You got me like fired up. No, as you should be. Uh Hey, Sarah, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to connect something on uh, some of the work that we're doing through this new task force, People's First Task Force. But it's not about the, the fact that it's the People's First Task Force. I'm going to focus on our first word, people, and, and tie it to what, what General DeBase uh, shared. And I, I, many have read about it. I won't go into the history of why the task force stood up. But what I would like to highlight uh, both for the Army and all the organizations in the Army, this, this task force jump started the energy necessary to tackle harmful issues that were impacting the readiness of our Army. And I'll put up that just a tad bit. I, I won't go into the mission of the task force, but we would not want sexual assault, sexual harassment, anything to impact our family. You wouldn't want one of those things to walk in your front door and start breaking up the cohesiveness of your family. I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but that's the intent of the deliverables of this past task force. So a prevention strategy, General Duvet mentioned a gap analysis. Hey, what do we need to do in our army with training, professional military education to make sure no one knocks on the door and those harmful issues impact my family? And your squad mate is your family. General Duvet is part of my squad, a teammate here. And, and hopefully that illustration resonates a little bit with, our, with the young leaders of all ranks and maybe on the next day. So when they get commissioned, when they finish the BLC, don't allow any of that stuff to get and impact your family. And engaged leaders do that. Squad leaders do it. GS-15s do it. It's all part of that cohesiveness we need. And if you just do that math, one plus two plus, I won't oversimplify it, but. Yeah, I think you get where I'm going. And at our level, that's what the task force is focused on, operationalized by everything that Forcecom, Tradeoff, and others are doing as well. And I'll get off my soapbox, but I wanted to share that with, with our future leaders. Uh, thank you, sir. I think that's a great way to kind of lay the roadmap of where we're going, how we're getting to where we are right now, and like you said, where we're going in the future. But um, we're unfortunately starting to run out of time. Uh, I wish we had more time to discuss this. Like I said, the people strategy is a big thing to get our arms wrapped around. But I, I wanna thank you, General Brodo, for taking the time to join us today and sharing some insightful information um, about the Army people strategy. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up today? Well, I, I, I guess I'll start, stop where I started and thank you for the opportunity. And for everybody serving military, uniformed or not, within training doctor command, uh, Great partners for our United States Army. We've had a lot of time in trade off as well. And if we continue to focus on assessing the best, recruiting the best, and delivering the best, we will have cohesive teams, engaged leaders, combat ready Army. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Look forward to future. Thank you again, sir, for joining us. Um, General Gervais, is there anything you'd like to leave with the audience? Yeah, hey, um, sir, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to, again to be back <clears throat> um, hosting this. And I think Gary summed it up. I mean, it does, it, it comes down to trust and the trust um, that we have in each other, in our equipment, you know, in our training and building the cohesive team. Because the Army is about people 
um, and it is about making sure that we're ready. And so it was a lot of great dialogue here today, and I really appreciated the opportunity. Absolutely, and uh, thank you both for your time and sharing imp this important information with us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in and submitted their questions. We hope you've been able to provide some insight into the importance of the Army People Strategy and how TRADOC is pouring effort into supporting this mission. Through the Army People Strategy, the Army will be able to generate a ready, professional, diverse, and integrated force of unbeatable cohesive teams. Focuses like talent management reform, improvements to quality of life for our soldiers, and a dedication to teaching and living the Army culture will continue to enable the Army to be the force that the nation can trust and count on. Join us next month when we welcome Dr. Gail Stern, the subject matter expert on sexual violence prevention for the White House and co-founder of Catharsis Productions for a discussion titled Understanding Sexual Violence Culture. That will be on April 22nd at 11 a.m., same place. And as always, thanks for joining us, and victory starts here.